Welcome to Statistics in Excel video number 82. Hey, if you want to download this Excel workbook and follow along, click on my YouTube channel, then click on my college website link, and you can download the workbook, Business 210, Chapter 8. Hey, we're in Chapter 8. We're doing confidence intervals. We have done a couple examples where we knew the population standard deviation sigma. Now we got to see what to do if we don't know it. So this is what we've been doing using z. That's our z value. We've been using the uh, norm s inverse and confidence function, but using this distribution. But that's when we knew sigma. Now we don't know sigma. We don't know the standard deviation of the population. So we're going to have to use s. There's our little s. And there's our t. That's how to calculate a t. It looks pretty, uh, pretty much exactly the same, except for we got an s right there. And if the uh, t values and the probability will come from the t distributions. Now, interestingly enough, a guy named William Seely Gossett uh, who worked at the Guinness Brewery in Dublin back in uh, uh, around the turn of the century, 1900. He wrote this paper in uh, 1908 that described the t distribution. Now, here's our standard normal curve. Very convenient. There's only one. But the t distribution has many distributions, not just one. And each one depends on the n the sample size, many t distribution. Let's go to our next uh, page here. t distribution, also known as the student's t. That's because uh, Gossett actually signed his paper uh, as uh, student. He wrote under the name student. Now, question, when are we allowed to use the t distribution? When the population is normal, bell-shaped, or nearly normal, or if your n is very large. Characteristics of the t distribution. Uh, it's a continuous distribution, bell-shaped and symmetrical. There are many, one for each n. The smaller the sample size n, the larger the standard deviation and the flatter the curve. Here's, for example, n15 and n20. n15 is uh, flatter and more spread out. Flatter, taller. Larger standard deviation, smaller standard deviations. So you really uh, oftentimes it uh, is not that much more difficult to get uh, a lar larger sa sample size. Now, at the center of the t-distribution, it's going to be flatter and more spread out than the standard normal, like we I just mentioned uh, a moment ago. For example, here's a 95% confidence interval. Here's a 95% confidence interval. But for t, notice 1.96 standard deviations uh, where we have 0.25, that's alpha divided by 2 there. But look at this, same alpha, the same risk, but in this distribution, 2.77. So uh, this one is n equals to 5. There's e a different dis um, distribution for each n. Uh, if you were to look them up into tables, there'd have to be a different uh, table for each n. We have functions, so we don't have to look them up in tables. Ah, But that's much more spread out. Think about this. Right here, we take our uh, standard deviation and multiply it by 1.96, right, to get whatever that margin of error is. But here, we have to take this, the standard deviation and multiply it by a bigger number, thus a bigger margin of error, flatter, more spread out. As And as n increases, t distribution ap approaches the normal standard curve uh, using z. Now, I want to. Um, Here's my handwritten notes. Notice it's almost exactly the same. Here is how we calculate a confidence interval. There's our x bar. There is a t instead of a z. And there's our standard error. And standard error, oh, that's an s instead of sigma. This, again, is going to be uh, that little part right there is the standard error. The whole thing is that margin of error that you add to the, the top and the bottom for whatever x bar. That gives us an interval to say something about, from our sample mean, to say something about the population parameter mu. Uh, let's go just jump ahead here. Uh, here's the example we're going to be doing. This is the, I'm going to do a couple of them. Here's the same one we did before. We just want to do the same calculation, but with t, we're not going to assume that we know the population standard deviation, and we'll get us a, uh, a larger interval. Let's go over to Excel.
Here's the same exact example. Solid construction company constructs des decks for residential homes. They send out two person teams to build decks. The company conducts a sample of 40 jobs and calculates a mean completion rate of eight hours to build a typical deck. Oh, so that mean is from a sample, right? The standard deviation of the population is not known. No, I, that's just so I put not there. The population uh, mean uh, standard deviation is not known, but s the calculate is calculated to be three. Now I just made this three exactly the same as before, just to see that we'll get a bigger interval. Now what's happening here is that means we're going to take a sample and get our x bar and our s two point estimates from the same sample. Let's go ahead and see how this is calculated, and we're going to use a new function called t inverse and next chapter we're going to use t dist also that the t means for uh, t distribution or t inverse that's when we given a probability and then we're given the t value uh, so we're going to see that here for the first time all right another aspect of uh, the t distribution is you d since n is determining uh, the shape of each one, uh, we're to actually, um, N is going to determine the shape, but S is a sample statistic. And so, because one of the sample statistics is being used, we actually have to calculate a new item called degree of freedoms. And it's always going to be whatever your sample size, N minus the number of samples. We only have in this chapter one sample. In other chapters, we have more samples. So degrees of freedom is always going to be equal. For us in this chapter, it just equals whatever the N is minus 1. That is one of the key inputs for calculating using the t dist or t inverse function. So that's our first calculated uh, item. Our x bar, we already were given that. Uh, and our s, we are also given that. But that's from sample data. Now we've got to calculate our standard error. Just as we saw, if I, oops, I missed it. Uh, right back here. Droop. There it is. So th there's our standard error, but we're going to use s this time. That's our margin of error. So we have to get a t, and then we have to calculate the standard error. We multiply that, and that's our margin of error. Standard error, our s divided by the square root of our n, the standard error, still calculated with the n. It's just the degrees of freedom we need for our uh, t distribution. 0.47, so that's in hours, right? That is the, uh, for our sampling distribution, standard error. Our confidence, we're going to keep it at 0.9, just like we did in our first one. Now our alpha, we know by now that alpha is always going to, that's the risk that our population parameter is not in our interval. It's always going to be 1 minus whatever confidence interval. That's the, the probability, the, how confident we are about our population parameter being inside the interval. Now, we calculate a lower t and an upper t. We're going to calculate always the upper t from the t inverse. Now, the t inverse is a little uh, funny. It's not like the rest of our uh, uh, f uh, binomial and normal distribution functions. So you just kind of have to get uh, used to it. I have some notes here. In next chapter 2, we'll see some... So uh, we'll see the t dist and learn some more about it. But for us, there's going to be two inputs. All you need is alpha. That is not divided by 2, the alpha. And it wants the degrees of freedom. Now, again, degrees of freedom is because once you have you're doing calculations with more than one sample, then you have to subtract uh, uh, more than one. And that's where this idea of degrees of freedom come in equals, and we're going to do t inverse, the probability. Notice it says probability, but I have your note here. That's alpha, comma, and then our degrees of freedom, that's right there. So there's just two inputs, and it's always going to calculate up on the upper side. So there is our t, 1.68. Etc. Now, a margin of error is simply whatever our t is times our standard error. There you go. There's our margin of error. That's the slop on either side of our 
x bar, so we get an interval. So we can say between these two, we're so and so, we're 90% sure that our population mean will uh, occur. Now, the confidence inner, the, the upper and lower, we'll do the lower first equals whatever our uh, sample is, 8 hours minus this one. And then equals 8 hours plus our margin of error. So last time we got uh, slightly different values, but now we got a, a lower value here and a higher value here. What does that mean? Since it's a little bit lower and this one's a little bit higher, that means there's more distance between them. And when you don't have sigma population standard deviation, that's what you need. You need a, a slightly bigger interval. Now concluding is similar to uh, what we did before, we can say the limits for the 90% confidence interval are between 7 hours 12 minutes and 8 hours and 48 minutes. It is reasonable to assume that the population mean is within our interval given a 10% risk. Now really the second sentence here is I stole this straight from the next chapter. This is hypothesis testing, not stolen from the, the next chapter. Uh, this is how they'll phrase it there and it really there's our 90% so that's pretty reasonable, right? We did uh, we're making reasonable uh, attempts to make an interval that should hold our population parameter. Again, just as before, really if we were to construct a hundred similar intervals, what it means is that 90 of them would have the population mean and 10 of them would not. All right, uh, when we come back, we'll have another example for when, when sigma is not known. See you next video.